All right, I'm going to try to do an intro. Hello, everybody. It's City Connect Tuesday. I got my City Connect hat on. My name's Schmitty, and the podcast is called Talking Schmidt. Today on the episode, super hyped. I have Chris Stropel on the show, kids. Chris is the first photo to ever be put on the cover of Thrasher magazine. The first cover was an illustration. The second cover, February 1981, was a photo of Chris doing a slash grind in a pool. A lot of controversy. SoCal guy, NorCal mag. Tune in, kids. A lot of history today. You're not going to want to miss it. Oh, my goodness. Head on down to your local shop. Ask Blood Wizard Skateboards. Or visit BloodWizard.com. For all your pondering needs. Tickety tack. A public service announcement. Enjoy those little things in life. Uh, right now, it's uh, my little KK Bear in the front seat with me as we drive. And he's talking about life being all philosophical. Last night it was to Jolly Bees with Mommy. By the time we got home, he was falling asleep in her lap in the back seat. No fighting, just us driving on a little cruise at night. Uh, this is what it really comes down to. Another one. Enjoy those little things as you get back to life, back to reality. Oh, Sarah Mani, feeling like Mike Vallely in public fucking domain. No comply a foot and a half high, six feet across as I land this hauling ass. First thing I'm thinking about is Mike fucking Vallely. Love you guys. Miss you guys. Hope everything's good. Stay up. Yeah, this is Chris Stropel. Uh, it is Thursday, uh, last day of uh, September, and uh, we're, we're online or Zooming here with uh, Talking Schmidt. It's cool, like tonight is the night. Here we go again. Just give it the old cause time, isn't it? All big dogs in. Schmitty. 96 times, Schmitty. Thanks, Schmitty. We on? Schmitty. Talking Schmidt. That's called going to the hospital, bitch. I can <laughs> shit my pants. Man. Your Rolodex is fucking deep. It's about the one, the one, the one. Who is this guy thinks he's tough shit? What's up? We're tastemakers. Come on, Smitty, what the fuck? Let's do it for Greg Smith. Yeah! Hello, kids. We're back. I got my black and orange on. It's the middle of October, and we're still playing baseball here in San Francisco. Today, I got a real special guest. Um, this is Chris Stropel, and he has the title of being the first photograph on the cover of Thrasher magazine, February, 1981. Chris, thank you for joining. Yeah, no problem, Schmidt. Good to have you. Yeah. How's it going? Where are you, where are you living these days? I'm in Monrovia, California, just, you know, not far from where I grew up in Sierra Madre. Okay. That's kind of out by where Lance is, uh, Right where Lance's ramp was. Yeah, he lived in Arcadia, just down Arcadia. the street. Yep, and uh, I'm about five blocks from Rusty's pool. <laughs> That's oh, okay. Kind of art for everybody these days. <laughs> uh huh. And where where did you where were you born and raised in like Petaluma area or uh, I always call it Petaluma Pasadena area. Yeah, I was actually born in Pasadena <laughs> in 1960. The, the home of Van Halen, right? That's David Lee Roth lives there, I think. Uh, Van Halen used to be called Mammoth before they became Van Halen and had a keyboard player, and they played in everybody's backyard. No way! Did you see them? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, tons. We used to. They, they, they were beer parties, you know, and so there'd be kegs in the back and all that sort of <laughs> stuff. And uh, they uh, they got they got quite big. They actually pl played at my uh, uh, junior high school dance at LaSalle High School in Pasadena, and it was a Catholic school, all boys. What? And, yeah, and they blew the living freaking ceiling off the damn gym, and, you know, all the Catholic girls' high schools. It was the biggest dance they'd ever had in the history of the school. And there was probably, you know, a thousand people inside the gym, and there's probably 5,000 standing outside partying. It was crazy. Holy shit. So were you, are you the same similar age? Were you, were you going to school with them or no? 
Um, my sister went to school, the same school, and my brother is uh, at Pasadena High School with David Lee Roth. Oh, my God. That's amazing. Uh, <laughs> we're big fans of that band. Uh, so I saw them later in life, but uh, I was stoked to get that before Eddie died for sure. Yeah, killer band. How did skateboarding come into your life? I started skating at a young age. We were living in uh, Pasadena in uh, an area called Hastings Ranch. And uh-huh. right a park called Hamilton Park. And I uh, used to steal my neighbor's. Uh, he had a Vita pack board uh, out of his garage next door and take it and go ride it on the tennis courts. And I was about 1966. I was a kid. And, so what uh, what was the boards like to describe like with the boards and wheel? That's before you're a thing, right? That's oh, like- yeah. It's all composite wheels with and it, you veneered boards, you know, with a, with a ringers in them, the beautiful boards. Uh-huh. And uh, he, he told me he was quite a bit older. He told me he caught me once with it. He says, next time you do that, I'll, I'll kick your ass. And so uh, I was like, yeah, right. You know, so he caught me and he <laughs> he kicked my ass. <laughs> but I kept still on his board. And finally, I saved enough uh, pennies in that and cashed enough Coke bottles to go buy a, a, my first board. <laughs> and what what's what's going on at that time? Like, are you going to like the toy store or whatever is around and you, and buying cones and setting them up. And like, is that how you get it into slaloming or like, well, how does it go? And what's, well, what are you skating? We live in the foothills. So there's Hills. Uh-huh. We have driveway. So I got used to, you know, bomb in the driveway and, uh, <laughs> and yeah, and our composite wheels and everything else, you can only imagine how that went. And so it basically, uh, sorry, I lost my light. Oh, and, you're good. It, uh, um, you know, we just skated when they had the park, the tennis court, and there was a, a, a adjoining basketball court and it was as smooth as a baby's butt. So it was really conducive to riding with uh, composite wheels and all that. Right. And, and one of the guys that was, uh, from the parks and rec a guy named Larry, who ran the park. He was a skateboarder in the sixties and a surfer. So he always, you know, barefoot and had a board and he really promoted it. So when, you know, from six to 10 years old, I was around Larry all the time. And he's the one that actually got me going in my first contest in the early seventies when there was municipal contest and all that sort of stuff. What was the contest like? It was a uh, freestyle and slalom. And like how it, many people would enter about? Um, it, it depended on this. If it was Sarah Madre, there'd be maybe 20 or 30. If it was Burbank, there could be 40 or 50 or, you know, La Crescenta or the, any of the, of the local, you know, municipalities that sponsored those types of events. And, and it, you know, you, the, the city council and that had to be talked into it pretty good, even back then. I mean, skateboarding uh, is still pretty taboo. <laughs> so the slalom is like a traditional race, right? Like whoever gets to the end is the winner. Correct. First, the freestyle, is it, are you doing are people doing tricks or like what wins the freestyle contest? Freestyle was tricks. I mean, it, and <clears throat> 70, 73, 74, I think was the first, uh, uh, California state championships was up in Ventura and in the, in the, um, up in the fairgrounds on the fairgrounds, but they had a park up there and that's where I saw skit Hitchcock and Tony TA and all those guys. And I competed against them, you know, huh. they try and slalom and slalom and all that. My mom drove me up there and dropped me off, picked me up about eight hours later. <laughs> what was the vibe like back then? Was there like, was there different clicks and stuff and animosity uh, and vibes and all that? Well, I mean, back then there was two guys, there's two group clicks, the guys on the coast that thought they invented everything and had it all down. And then us inlanders or vowels or whatever, you know, uh, huh. <laughs> We with the SGV San Gabriel Valley is where I'm from. So and it was uh, the SGV was marked everywhere, especially if you were down in the gang areas, because it was that was their their tag was SGV. So we kind of just adopted that. And um, but yeah, it, they kind of looked at you funny. But the other part of that was you know where we are and, and uh, the types of houses here. We had equally as good of pools and all that as, as they had in Beverly Hills or anywhere else. And it was just on the way down low. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I was wondering, I was looking through some of the um, early mags back then. And uh, I'm wondering if the uh, 
in my mind, it seemed like there was the downhill, the slalom and the freestyle, and then like kind of maybe more of a underground scene skating pools that not everybody's in tune with. And then possibly Greg Weaver's cover for that first skateboarder mag comes out and that maybe opens up more eyes to pool skating. Would that uh, be it, accurate? Uh, it did. And I mean, back then we were it's like, you know, Pine and, and TA and all, all those guys, we we're all, all around skaters. We did everything. And uh, freestyle slalom, it didn't matter. Downhill, I mean, downhill was, I really loved downhill and a lot. And uh, uh, my, my older brother, one of his buddies took me to a pool I was probably 74 right down the street here was in a, a old motel. And this was uh, even prior to the, the cover coming out with Weaver on it. And, you know, we we're riding, it was on a black night and I was riding a 12 foot pool. Damn. And, so, and uh, he came back, told my brother, he says, your little brother's crazy. I don't know. <laughs> nobody carve over that light. He did it his first time on his black night board. You know, and it was a bunch of guys with their trunks on and riding water skis and, you know, everything and anything that they could ride. Uh -huh. it was crazy. And then the urethane thing broke, you know, which was awesome. That, that changed the whole deal, especially in the pools. What year was that about where the urethane came out? 74, 75. 75, four, okay. And and the the skateboarder mag was, was at 70, late 70s, right? Yeah, 76, I want to say, 77. I guess that's <laughs> okay, so it all kind of was happening at the same time. Like, dudes are skating pools. We need to figure out a better wheel. Yeah, I, I don't know if that's what Nasworthy had in mind, but, I mean, just to make a wheel out of – I mean, there was there was types of other wheels, like metal flex wheels that the roller skaters had mm. that was harder plastic. And what Nasworthy did was come up with a, a formula that softened the plastic and put a little more rebound in it and everything else. And uh, it worked. You know, I mean, it was still ball bearings back then, too. That was before sealed bearings. You had a cup, eight yeah. inch pulls, Chicago trucks. Crazy. <laughs> so in the 70s, you're skating and stuff like, are you a fan of other skaters or are you not even like, do you know about photos or like magazines aren't really out yet, right? Like, do you know who Tony Alva is or just through contests and stuff? Or is it? All those guys at the contest, and that was the first time I really got, you know, and some of the other skaters when we, outside of this area when we went to compete in that. And then obviously the mag came out and it started blowing it up then, you know, like, oh, hey, I, you know, I could do this, you know, right. skating pools. What's, what's this guy doing this? And I mean, Greg's a good friend, a weaver in that. And he'll tell you, it's like, God, at least they could have got a picture of me hitting tile or something. <laughs> I love the old beef. I love Olsen critiquing all his photos in the interview. He's like, these are all shit. It's so oh, yeah. Funny. Oh, yeah. Well, he's, he's, he's a live wire on that stuff, too. <laughs> yeah. Well, so the inspiration comes from interacting with one another. It's not a visual like dream sequence where you see like something that you're not a part of. Like there's not really much of that. So all your experience is what you're actually doing then at that time yeah and i mean locally here it was just you're in a pool you're getting pushed and you know you're seeing a guy an older guy and he's like riding up a you know the shallow end which is unheard of at the time and then more tranny and just bigger pools and it, yeah it kind of pushed you and then being young and, and completely naive as as to how effed up you could get mm. didn't there was no fear so it's it kind of had an advantage over the older surfer guys that, you know, they, they skated hard, but I was light and you just took the pools. I just took to like, there was no tomorrow. I was, I was kind of, and, you know, I still did some freestyling and that and some demonstrations and, and, uh, uh, I remember doing a, a bunch of demos with Curtis Hesselgrave for the San Diego school district and uh, mm -hmm. teaching safety and I was his victim, you know, so to speak. And I'd go and fall off the board and Curtis would, he'd lecture and, you know, we we're doing like second, third graders and all the way up to sixth grade and junior high. It was a good paying gig. <laughs> <laughs> was, uh, was it looked down upon to have shoes and grip tape or was there no grip tape yet? Like uh, I, a lot of people were barefoot uh, skating with no grip tape, right? Yeah, there wasn't any grip tape at that point. And then, you know, we got the smart idea to go raid the, 
you know, they had strips for stairs or whatever that was kind of the, uh, the first. So we went and bought every piece of that we could at the local hardware store and started using that a little bit. And then that, that helped or, or uh, resin with, uh, with some silica in it on, as a top coating. You just influenced somebody. So you're truly going from surfing. Like that's where it was. It was like barefoot on maybe a little resin on the board or something to hold your feet, but kind of that same vibe. Yeah. Oh yeah. And then like the first, you know, uh, fiberglass boards that like Hobie made that were real flexible and that there was no grip to those at all. And if your feet started sweating, it was dangerous as hell. Yeah. And like <laughs> running shit out. Like what about yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the older Hobies had kind of a cross. They, they they molded a pattern in the top. So there was a little bit of more of a grip in them, like the, uh, the kind of a tan board. I'm sure you've seen them with yeah. a little number in them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of people were starting to get on to uh, uh, having some sort of grip on the board. <laughs> Did you see your first air in a pool in person or in a magazine? Uh, first airs was with Wally. And we're just screwing around with them. And then the, the first really, you know, uh, I'd say landable air that I saw in that was with Wally and that at Reseda at Skater Cross, believe it or not. Huh. Damn. <laughs> That's amazing. So when the mag comes out, do you, do you, are you aware that the first mag's out right when it hits? Like, how does it get? Uh, yeah. I mean, we were stoked. There was some good, wow, Skateboarder Magazine, you know, this is really cool, you know, and just went through that. And it was like, yeah, it's nice that it was getting some, uh, getting some, some props, so to speak. How did they promote it? Was it word of mouth and just like in shops or was there ads on TV or anything or? For skateboarding? No, the Skateboarder Mag, it just showed up at, you know, the 7-Eleven or at the Mag Rack or down at the, you know, the local uh, bookstore would have a big magazine rack or whatever. And now and all of a sudden you're like, wow, because they had Surfer Magazine, obviously. Right. And it, was it in the record stores too, probably? Like whatever it was, record? Uh, not so much in the records. In the record store, you'd see all the old Freddie Freeloader cartoon comic books and high times and all that sort of stuff, but not much mm. skate stuff. <laughs> That's when you could buy anything in a record store. <laughs> so who are the dudes that you're starting? Like as, as this, the eighties kind of come into the eighties, are you, do you have like, is it you and Wally is kind of like. I'm at Wally at a uh, at Montebello skate park. And, okay. uh, and uh, you know, I refused, I didn't like paying. So I used to always just sneak in the back and him and Strandlin and Hesselgrave were working there. And so finally, Stralin just says, hey, man, told Wally, you got to go get this guy out of here. He's freaking, he, he doesn't get it, you know. And so I told Wally, I said, you let me in. I'll take you on. Do you skate pools? He goes, yeah, I skate pools. I see you let me in. I'll, I'll, I'll take you. I'll take you to how many, you know, I'll take you to some pools. He's looking at me. Well, where do you live? And I said, up Sarah Madre. He goes, well, what kind of pools? I said, well, what kind of pool do you want to skate? A square, a kidney, <laughs> a pool? And he just looked at me like, wow. So I. I didn't drive. We got it, you know, while he got, he's driving and drove up there and he, I showed him like three pools and he, he came back and told Stranley, you wouldn't believe what this guy skates in all the time. <laughs> just right down the street. <laughs> How are you finding pools back then? Just, you know, our Arcadia, like big houses have big pools. And so there was like spillways that ran down certain streets and that and we could come over and the, the bigger estates, the pools were fenced off in the back, you know, either in, they'd have a 16 foot ivy fence. So most of the people wouldn't even know you were in there. If you, if we came in over the spillway and climbed up over the fence into where the pool was and drained them. Right. That's where the whole in a pool service started. The first original pool service was in a pool service, but. Oh, so you yeah. were actually draining people's pools. They weren't just already drained. Yeah, or they had to, you know, they were half filled or whatever. But uh, you know, we high school, Montecito, there's a big fire in Montecito, in, I'm going to say mid 70s, 76 or whatever. And Wally and I went up there to the burn and, and skated some pools. And then a lot of people left their pumps around where the pools were so they could pump to get the fires out. So we heisted a couple pumps and then we heisted some pool equipment. And uh, 
I went down to J.C. Penney's and we decided Inouye's pool sounded better than Stropel's pool service. Had a better, <laughs> right? And went down to Penny's and got we uh, got a, a picture of Wally's skate of, of, of pool and we put Inouye's pool service on it. In fact, I think Wally still has one of those shirts, the original ones. Rad. He sent me a couple of stickers. I was super stoked. <laughs> um, did you guys have like a bro that was getting into photography at the time that would cruise with you to shoot photos or was there no photos? Um, Talbot shot some photos. I mean, some of the younger guys around here, oh, oh, shot a bunch of photos. You know, if we let them into the pool, but we were pretty strict with the Groms back then. If they got a pool busted, they, were, they got busted. Uh huh. <laughs> There, there was skate law. It wasn't like today where everybody's all, oh, God, don't, don't be so mean. It's like, man, you come here and bust this pool or paint it, you're going to die. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, okay, let's get into the Thrasher. Thrasher starts January uh, 81. There's an illustration on the cover. Do you, do you see that, Mag? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like I, right I, when it comes I, out. I mean, Thatcher and Mofo from the Hester series and all that prior to that. So, okay, I'd been up to San Francisco and saw those guys who cruised up around there with them quite a bit. Um, and then they they were starting this mag thing, and and KT called me one day and says, "Hey man, you got any pools down there? I'd like to go shoot some pools." And I'm all, "Yeah, I got a couple of great ones." You know, that particular pool is right across uh, from uh, Pasadena City College, Pasadena. Huh. And a buddy of mine, Freddie Johnson, that I went to high school with, was living there. He oh. was a bass player. And so he, he didn't let anybody skate it. And he had a couple of female girlfriends that were as hot as could be living there. And he told him, this guy can come skate this pool anytime he wants. Only him. <laughs> and so, yeah, so I took KT there. And I, I had no idea. I didn't really even know I was going to be on the cover until it kind of came out. Did you guys shoot that photo before the first mag had come out or after yeah. the first? Yeah, I mean, the, the delay in magazines then, it wasn't like instant download digital, you know. It had right. They lay it out. Yeah. I, mean, I was, uh, Skateboarder Magazine or, or Surfer Publications, I was actually a, a picture of me that Goodrich took was on all their business cards. And mm. so Surfer Publications was in Capistrano and you know, we knew Warren really well in that. And so we'd go up there and watch them when they were laying out both Surfer and Skateboarder magazine and everything's on a, you know, the table with slides and all that. And they're just pitching stuff and this will work. I mean, old school way. I, I, it was it was awesome to see. Yeah. Uh, describe Kevin Thatcher for people that don't know who he is. Uh, KT was a great skater and a, a great ambassador for the sport. You know, he just wasn't. And a good guy to start the mag. He had just a vision and like, you know, there was skateboarder and that. And Thrasher just came out with, you know, and knowing Fausto too, they just put an edge on it. It was way more skate, you know. Uh, skateboarder was more uh, artistic in a sense that, you know, Bolster and his eye as being a, an editor and that was really picky about pictures and that where Thrasher was like, we're going to print this raddest picture and it might have a little flaw here, but it's going to be a freaking rad picture. <laughs> yeah. It was more raw. Kind of like skateboard world too, with the sharks and that, I mean, the, mm. the old backyard documentation of pools and that was uh, far more rad than skateboarders ever was. I mean, skateboarder had beautiful pictures in it and that and they were always aesthetically great. But, you know, if you want to just see hardcore, you know, uh, pool pictures and skating. It was always skateboard world or thrasher. Do you remember um, where you were or how you found out, like seeing the cover for the first time? I think I was in San Diego and I was in, it was a seven 11 or something. And there's this thrasher mag. And somebody says, Hey man, you're on the cover of this, this magazine thrasher. I'm like, what? You know? So I looked around, went down there and that was it. I was like, Hey man, that's, that's pretty cool. That's, we got the SGV on the freaking cover of this bag. That's in Pasadena too. It was really stuck. I mean, I was more surprised because of the whole NorCal SoCal stuff that, you know, they would never put a freaking SoCal boy on their, you know, mag. I mean, cause the first picture was basically some art of black art, you know, of Ricky. And uh, so to get, to make it on there was, uh, it was pretty awesome. 
I mean, Grosso came up with a pretty intense theory that I never thought about that he told me, he goes, you know why you're, you're on there? He goes, because you were Tracker's fair-haired boy and the down south guy, and you're riding independence in that freaking cover shot. And it was just like an F you to Tracker and all the rest of them. So I was like, man, I, where'd you come up with that? You know, Jeff was like, damn, it's a Grosso theory. But it was a bad photo anyways. Well, do you remember like some of the reactions? What kind of stuff were you hearing people say? I know about the NorCal SoCal stuff. So was there was there like people just like tripping on it or was that a little bit more in hindsight when we look back like, wow? Yeah, there was a little you hear a little feedback but everybody is pretty much stoked, you know, because it's just it was a, a aggro picture of some gnarly grind in a backyard pool and, you know, in Pasadena. And it's just I, I, I KT taking that photo and that and using it was just awesome. I think he just wanted something to just, this is a thrasher right here, you know, and, I, and believe me, that pool was fun. And it was, that's a Gibson skated the hell out of it too. I used to take text there quite a bit. Oh, nice. Is that the same one that he has a photo inside? He's doing the, like a front side yeah. Ollie. Uh, yeah. Okay. Rad. Do you have any photos inside the mag or are you just on the cover? I can't even remember. Uh -huh. <laughs> it was just a cover at that point. It's amazing because I, I mean, obviously the mag's 40 plus it will for, this is the 40th year. Um, and so things have obviously grown and everything, but like, it's always been cool to be on the cover. It, oh, yeah. you, you know what I mean? So I'm, but to something so new, you don't know the magnitude of like, Oh, is this just a zine that's going to be around for a little bit? Or is this going to have 40 years life, you know? And you look at it now and it's one of the thickest magazines that's out on all, you know, book stands or newsstands or whatever. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the tradition and how it's carried on has just been awesome. You know? Yeah. Well, have you been, you kind of pay attention to the mag still like throughout all the years? Oh, I got a subscription. Sure. You know, uh -huh. it's, See what's going on and you know i still skate and it's, just, it's cool you know and 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 uh, to see how it's progressed after phelps passed away and now they've done a really good job of uh you know uh, going forward with it and um it, it, it is it's like our mag is the last one left and i mean i've been on covers prior to that i was on a cover of skateboarder I was on the cover of modern photography um, I don't know. Most people wouldn't remember in, in, in this day and age, wild world of sports that used to be on TV. I don't even know if that's a word. They ran all these. They were one of the first ones to ever show skateboarding on TV. Right. And so it, were they you did, on one of those programs. Well, they, they came out with a 25th anniversary magazine. And in that there's a picture of me skating and you go a couple pages and there's a picture of Muhammad Ali. So, Oh mom, I equated that to wow. be you know, these incredible athletes. And here's a skater. I was like, that's awesome. You know, that they were able to do that. And don't ever call a skater an athlete. You'll get killed. <laughs> and, and the, let, and best, the best athletes in the world. That got proved out this summer. I'll tell yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember John Hudson uh, on uh, that's incredible? No. But I knew Hudson. Yeah, I mean, I skated Catalina Classic with Piercy and Hudson and all those guys uh, when they were running that race over in Catalina. But no, I don't. I, I don't remember him. On that's incredible. He did. Uh, I think he did at that time the fastest um, recorded speed on a skateboard. Was that like, at Six Hill? It was at uh, Palos Verdes. Oh, okay. They did a Palos Verdes. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it was on ABC, the whole deal. I mean, I, I forget the year, but it was like at the time. I mean, anytime like Farrah Fawcett was on a skateboard or something, it was just like, oh, it was crazy. I mean, now it's like it's everywhere. But back then it wasn't the case. Oh, yeah. And Farrah was smoking on that skateboard, too. <laughs> yeah, she was. <laughs> oh, man. Uh Talk about Blackheart a little bit. Did you have a relationship with him early on or did that come uh, later? Ricky, I, I, Blackheart is a great skater. When he was down here and I was up there, when the, you know, the Hester series went through Northern Cal and now I, I got to know him really well and uh, always respected his skating. And, you know, he just charged. We, we got along really well. And uh, so still to this day, you know, I consider him a good friend. Yeah, he said if I uh, send him a check for $10,000, he'll do 15 minutes of my podcast. 
<laughs> is that is that real? That's about fourteen thousand nine hundred ninety nine. <laughs> I love Blackie. He was a huge insp- uh, like when I first started working at the mag. He was he was there and he was building shit for Fausto, but just the best. Like always, like he had like the snide little comments and everything. And he just skated as free as anybody. I rode his wheels. Mm. For a bit too, you know, and uh, there was, those were some of the first real conical, smaller diameter wheels that came out that, that really ran well. So, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, um, yeah, I wanted to just maybe go through a couple people's names that I know you have either looked up to and or had relationships with. Obviously, um, you got the Waldo shirt on. Uh, talk <laughs> about Don Autry. Uh, and Waldo getting in the Hall of Fame was it should have happened 10 years ago, but that's a if the it's in there, it's water under the bridge. But I mean, Waldo was one of the best all around skaters ever. And I mean, I was <laughs> I was a roommate of his in Strandland and Hesselgrave when I was about 16 years old in Cardiff. And so that really got to know Waldo. I met Waldo at the Fruit Bowl originally. Uh huh got to know him really well and uh obviously being real it's like an older brother to me love that guy like a brother and i was skated baldy with him you know when baldy didn't even have paint on it and oh, uh damn he kind of took me under his wing and i mean waldo could skate unbelievably warm too kevin anderson waldo um but waldo was downhill i mean even when they were losing and all that and skate racing downhill with it uh, when they had that whole circuit going and uh x games and I mean, I saw him do 75 miles an hour down a pass in Mammoth. You know, I mean, it just, Fuck. you know, he, he could do 50 360s. And I mean, he could freestyle, he could slalom, he could skate bulls and pipes. And he's just a good all around guy and, a, and a, a great human being, too. I always smile on his face. What kind of guy was he off the board? Was he a pretty, was he a big party or crazy guy? Like, did he have like just that? I think Most skaters was, have that uh, wild, like push themselves to the, you know, edge mentality. No, Waldo, Waldo liked beautiful woman for one. And womanizer. Was, not a womanizer. They, they were attracted to him. And I mean, he had this huh. in, uh, ability to, I mean, I remember one time when we were roommates and that he shows up and I look outside and there's a Rolls Royce and there's these two ladies on his arm and he's all, Hey man, it, can you come down and keep this other gal, co- you know, company and or whatever. And I'm like, Oh, geez, where did Waldo? He didn't have a dime to his name. <laughs> Just, it, it was incredible. And these ladies were smoking hot North County mamas as you'd ever seen. And it was just Waldo. And, uh, he had, he had, he had the silver tongue, so to speak. Mm. And then also being a hairdresser, I was like, he, he was like, what's a movie with Warren Beatty or shampoo or whatever. People send me soap. It's crazy. Uh-huh. Uh, and, uh, yeah, you know, he used to like to have a cocktail or two, but uh, he was yeah, an incredible human being. <laughs> nice. And yeah. then uh, Wally and you kind of came up together. Is that fair? Yeah. Like I said, Wally, I mean, when I met him in Montebello, and then it was just a friendship, and we still have it. I mean, we've been friends for 40 something years or longer. And I mean, we just skated, we fueled each other skating, you know, and, and he always had this incredible style. And I mean, I was just like break through the wall and, you know, bang your head on it. And while you just skate around it and, and incredibly, and uh, we pushed each other. Mm. And obviously, uh, you know, he, he had what about six covers on skateboarder and that. And I mean, he, he's just, he, his style was, uh, you know, like Shogo and, you know, Jay back then it was all in that you know, kind of class, so to speak. And uh, Wally's been a great friend. Nice. Tom, uh, Tom Sims, do you know him? Yeah. Tom was, was my first sponsor. I skated for Sims. Oh. In fact, I have a, you know, we're just about to come out with a model. And uh, Tom, you know, kept making up these shapes and he gave them to me. And I'm like, Tom, these, these aren't going to work. You know, I'm all, this Chinese wood isn't going to work, you know, and that. And so, he kept insisting. In fact, I have one where he, he hand wrote my name on it and misspelled my name. And then uh, I tell you, he goes, well, why won't it work? And I have the board together and we we're up in Santa Barbara at the, at the shop. And I put my foot right through the board, broke it in half. I said, this is why it's not going to work. We, I can't put my name on something like this. And, mm. uh, you know, Stropley, you're always freaking such a pain in the ass and all that. I love Tom, but I was like, 
So uh, about that time, I met Curtis Hasselgrave, and Curtis Hasselgrave introduced me to Billy Castor. And Castor was making surfboards, and he had this guy that he was making some skateboards for him, this guy named uh, Charlie Watson. And uh, so <laughs> I went down there, and he they developed this fiber lamb material, and now I, I you know I left a pretty lucrative contract with Tom, and I just went and sk skated for Billy. Billy, you know, gave me a couple surfboards a year, and then it was just Wally and I. And Tom just had an enormous team. It, so every time he'd go somewhere, there was ten more guys that skated for Sims, and you know, it was he did it in bulk. And it, Castor was Wally and I to begin with initially, and then you know, Tex and, and Kyle and, and Baker and a bunch of the other guys, that, the amateurs that skated for us. But Tom used to, when he was developing his snowboards, developed a used to test them up here in the Angeles National Forest. Oh, wow. Waterman and Cracker Ridge. And I had he, a passed away. he saw a picture of me on a mountain bike up in the forest. And he, I get this text, hey, man, that's Strawberry Peak. Oh, how the hell do you know? So I call him. <laughs> he goes, oh, shit, I used to go there all the time and everything else. So, yeah, no, oh, Tom was pretty instrumental like Pal. And it was funny. His office was right, right across the street was George Pal's office in Santa Barbara back when they were both <laughs> started. Did those guys get along or was there like tent or is there competitive? They did some collaborations early, but then uh -huh. they just split apart, you know, from there. Right. Was the complete opposite personality than George, you know? And, yeah. And just, yeah. <laughs> it's like oil and water. <laughs> and then the dude from Vision, it was kind of Vision, uh, Sims were like together at some point almost, weren't they? I was like, on when it was dying Dorfman kind of picked up the ball and, and and went with it a little bit and kind of just used the name and the label and all that so uh, okay yeah well oh, so much crazy shit what's up okay talk about John Gibson I'm gonna have him on the program coming up soon I, what do we need to know oh, about old Tex Tex I've met Tex when he's a little kid in Houston and uh He's riding this park and I saw him doing Ollie and I was like, man, he does it better than Gelfand or anybody soul that I did seen at that time doing Ollie. He was just a natural skater too. And uh, growing up with his, all his brothers and now being the youngest and from Texas, he had the right demeanor. He didn't talk much. He just skated. He let all his skate and do the talking. Mm. Yeah. We brought him out here. Nobody knew him. You know, even Lance to this day he goes, the guy showed up at a contest. He was <laughs> Where the hell did this guy come from? He skates for Castor, and you know, uh, <laughs> he, and he got a he got a first rate skate education out here. Uh -huh. I mean, out, the deal was with his mom, and Castor was really big in staying in school. Is that we brought him out for the first summer, and he'll probably say the story too. Where you know, I told him I'll bring you out here, and he's like, but he's all yeah. He told his mom, well. Chris called and my tickets waiting at the airport or he told me the story and he goes, his mom goes, yeah, right. She drove me there thinking, oh, yeah, poor kid's going to be really disappointed. Then the ticket was there and he came out here, freaked her out. She called Castor right away. He says, now he's under good hands. So he stayed at my house, Wally's parents' house, my parents' house and all that. We, we kept him, we kept him out of harm's way for the most part. <laughs> There's some <laughs> stuff we let him go do, especially in his youth. <laughs> Did you go out to Texas at all? Yeah, I spent a lot of time in Texas. Donnell uh, Distributing, uh, the singers were one of the biggest distributors there out there at the time, and they, they carried Castor stuff. And so we did a lot of uh, demos and that for Donnell and Castor. That's where I found Tex. Oh, okay. For, did you skate any for, of the pipes? Uh, Amarillo. You did? Damn, yeah. that, that one's the one. No, the Arizona pipes were probably – to me, that's the Jaws or the, the, the Waimea Bay of skating. I mean, especially the sections in that. There was nothing I can compare those to as far as just skating. Sal would probably say the same thing. Pools are great. In that Those pipes were beyond anything that you'd skate, like magical almost. Really? Yeah, the speed and everything else. I mean, I had a custom boards that, I, that made them were thinner and a little longer because the wider boards, it, it just – the smaller with its with a smaller wheelbase pivoted off, especially when you got up, you know, 10 o'clock, 10 30 in those pipes. Mm. And they were as smooth as a baby's butt. Mm -hmm. Part of that whole section was it was it was under the guise of the salt 
salt water, salt river water project to bring water into Phoenix and now it's outlying areas. But the other part of it was back in then it was the Reagan era and that was the, the MX missile project where they buried those pipes and, and some of them were lead lined. And we're like, why would these pipes have lead in them? Well, they were running the missiles around them in the middle of the desert and they could pop them up at any time. Oh shit. So that's what we got busted by guys. That, there weren't sheriffs one time while well, we were at one section and these guys showed up in a Cadillac with suits on <laughs> yeah, Phoenix. And it was like, man, it wasn't, they were feds. And so we're like, wait, this isn't the local podunk sheriff coming out here to bust us or whatever. Uh-huh. You're but it's getting- really to find the, the pipe sections because the, the equipment was so massive to move and make those that they basically had to grade like a six lane highway through the desert. So when you're flying over, you just saw this, you know, not just a little dirt road, but this massive dirt road carved in the middle of the desert. So we'd kind of mark where that was. So we could go find those sections. And then there were sections just right off the freeway, off the eight or the 10. It's crazy. Do you remember meeting Salva for the first time? I met the Salva brothers or Alba brothers when they were little Grammys at a, uh, 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 pipeline and uh the, like two brothers they fought like a cat and dog yeah both incredible skaters and uh sal is still to this day i mean his motor in him we just used to call him the machine because he could go in a bowl and spend 10 minutes in there and still can i think i mean that's that's one of the reasons when he won uh i think it was first half it was spring valley and uh you know back then it was two minutes for a run in a contest. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. now doing 45 seconds, the guys are still gassed, but can you imagine two minutes and, and without the, the, the uh, whole side of tricks everybody does now, you know, back then it was wheelers and grinds and maybe some cars and that, but there was really no air or anything else. And I mean, Salva just grounded out two minutes in that bowl, man. And he's like, mm-hmm. everybody else was gassed. <laughs> Who do you think he got most of his influence from? Like, just a lot of guys, you know, the L Pool, Tay Hunt, um, Geheimer, the Ransom, and those guys. Kimball, Kurt Kimball. Kimball yeah. is a rad skater. And I mean, the guys, Upland, uh, especially the pipeline, was, was a real proving ground because of its size and, and enormity at that time with the pipe in it and the 15 footer. Yeah. And if you think that you could go, you could kill anything else. And just being around the people that came out there to skate, like the worm. Uh-huh. Worm rip that and then paramount happened which was paramount was like an abortion with you know it's six feet of solid vertical on it and yeah, it's crazy orton remember orton frank blood orton used to come out and try to fly out the opposite end of the pipe which is, george was nuts <laughs> that's, that's sick um what so what's it like with the valley guys and the dogtown dudes and the the coastal that you know all that stuff is that like is that just forever or does at some point it kind of well it's been pushed to the background because we're all older and mellower now but back in the day it was pretty heavy duty uh-huh. you know the jer and senator and, and Bo and all those guys and then you had you know dogtown and you know ta and binyak and polar bear and shogo and i mean I did a lot of traveling with Shogo and I need, you know, TA, Jay, I always got along with Jay. Jay used to come down and stay with Wally and I in Cardiff and surf. And uh, so we got, we got along with them pretty well, but like the Valley guys, you know, San Fernando Valley guys and them, there was always a little friction going on there. Was like there fights? Um, there could be if they didn't, you know, know who they were or whatever. Huh. I mean, most of the, most of the guys, Dogtown guys wouldn't venture up into the Valley too often unless there was like skate or cross or there was a pool or that, but you know, it was pretty territorial back then. Right. I mean, basically everybody thought skateboarding, you know, revolved around Southern California for the most part. Yeah. I think that's why there was some animosity from Northern California because of the amount of skaters up there Mm -hmm. and who was that? I mean, they had a lot of really great skaters and now skater can come from Nebraska and freaking kill it, you know? Yeah. (laughs) Was uh, was it sketchy for you guys to go to Venice? If you didn't know anybody, yeah. Yeah. Wally knew. We just, you know, we knew the guys down there, and so you're, you're good. Mm-hmm. It was just like being around here. If you went down to go skate a pool in South El Monte and didn't know any of the Vatos, you, you could be really dangerous and <laughs> quickly. Right. Like, 
growing up in Monterey Park, he knew all these guys in Montebello or Bejo, as they called it, in, in East L.A. So those pools and that, I mean, the, the freaking the essays, they, they, they knew where the pools were. But you didn't even go down there unless you had some permission or knew somebody. You could get, I mean, it, we saw shit go down there. You wouldn't want to see go down anywhere else. Yeah. So, Jesus Christ! Did you, uh, what about San Francisco? Did you come up here at all in those early days? Yeah. Skated to the windy, twisty rug, you know, and then all that. And, oh, uh, like Lombard? Yeah, Lombard and, and bomb some hills and just cruise around with some clubs at KT and Mopo and underground stuff and all that. Yeah, it was fun. And now, a very special first impression with the one and only Mofo. This is Mofo checking in. I want to talk about Stropel back in the 70s when I first got into skateboarding. Stropel was the guy. And that shape of his deck is so fucking killer. Then, when I got a job at the magazine and I got to actually meet the guy, I didn't even know if I could form words at the time. But he was so straight up, forthcoming, and awesome skater, hardcore rock and roll, and there's other stuff that I won't mention. But Stropa was the guy, he still, he was the guy, he is the guy, he will continue to be the guy. All right, this is Mofo signing off. Is that after Thrasher starts? Um, it was like kind of before that. Oh, really? And a little bit after, yeah, because it was kind of after that I was dying. Uh -huh. I was just there wasn't more terrain in san francisco mm. you know it was so condensed that there you know you guys didn't have as many pools in that and that sort of stuff so it was more an outlying area but what you did to adapt the skate was awesome they had that pipe i think it's bora bora did you ever go to that one no okay yeah it's down kind of by san jose area yeah. Square one in the city I, I can't remember the name but it was pretty tough pool oh jungle bowl i think I think it was Fong was, was there and yeah, yeah Joe. Yep. Yeah, oh man. I, <laughs> I, I love it. So is it true? Did you are you credited with inventing the alley oop and the board slide? Yeah. Damn. I did the alley square pool here in Sierra Madre called the Seal Bowl. First ones I've done I did. And uh it was uh um yeah, just an offshoot of doing regular air. And it, the, he'd carve the corner of the square pool and into the shallow end. And it just said, well, geez, I just lift off and fly backwards. And I mean, it, it wasn't, it, it took a little while to get used to it. But I mean, that was, I think I got it here. Let's give you a picture. That's a seal bowl. Oh, sick. And so this, this, this bowl, it had, ivy fence around it and everything else in the house it burnt down and it was on a cul-de-sac so that that bowl is it was pretty much my private bowl another guy that used to skate kirk talbot and uh and we skated that thing for a good couple of years without anybody knowing it was there and the, the power was in the, the, in the pool room that still had power so we were able to get a stereo and a little fridge in there and i mean i get done soccer practice i played varsity soccer and i'd take my moped down and go skate the pool and the, there was lights from the baseball field that kind of illuminated it enough so yeah skate the hell out of it the great pool was alley oop already something in surfing like how did the name alley oop uh, oh i got alley oop because i loved the lakers when i was growing up as a kid and chick hearn used to call it the alley oop you know yeah you know, Goodrich to Baylor on an alley oh, oop, right. Timberland, and I was like, "So, he's all, did you invent that?" You know, an alley oop was a cartoon character too, and I said, "No, no, I stole it from Chick Hearn." You know, and it just seemed like natural because when they floated the ball up to do a dunk or whatever, it was just alley oop it extended the air as it normally would. It was just the feeling of it and the weightlessness of it compared to a front side or back side air was was pretty cool back then. Damn. So is that the same place where you did board slide rocks? Too? No, board slide rocks. I did first ones. I saw Tim Martin do a, you know, a, a rock and roll it was the first guy I ever saw do one up, I think Newark or wherever. So I came down and, and, uh, 
uh, skin Del Mar or whatever. And, and I just said, Chip, well, you can just carve into this. And why don't you slide and come out of it like a rock and roll? So it literally took a, a day or two and we're doing, you know, and this was before rails or anything else. And there was no deck on Del Mar in that keyhole yet either. Oh, shit. So, yeah, it was, a, you, we just carved, get it going as fast as you could and just hit it. Uh-huh. Yeah. Out of out of those parks, what was the your favorite one? I love the bowl at Winchester. I really like tacos. Del Mar was obviously had everything in it. And I mean, the keyhole was actually where all the contests were. And like, I mean, it was a breeding ground of guys developing themselves. Hawk, Gator, you know, there's so many guys that came out of skating that bowl because they could learn tricks in it so easily. Mm. And the keyhole wasn't even original part of the plan. It was put in as an afterthought when the park was done. It's oh, crazy. Damn. But uh, the Upland, obviously, the pipeline was always dear to me and the Hoffmans and that. I mean, uh, Wally and I remember we got wind that, that they were going to build this park out in Upland. So we went out there and they had the, it, it was chalked out in the dirt. I hadn't even dug it yet. And we're like, did you see how big this bowl is? Like, like, no way they could build anything. And then when they dug it out before they even, you know, put any, any, any uh, rebar in it or anything else, it's usually a lot deeper and bigger. And we walked down into the 15 footer. I was like, there's no way we're going to be able to escape this thing. It is just too enormous, too big, mm-hmm. you know, and the pipe, the, the pipe they built regular and then they built the top separately and put it on top and then sealed it. So the top part of the pipe was a lot smoother than the bottom part of the pipe in there. And then to drop into the, to the, uh, into the, into the bowl after that. And then, you know, then when the combi came, combi separated men from boys that that bowl initially with a you know three inch coping and in the fur on it 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 was a double it was not a double black diamond it was a triple black diamond uh-huh. <laughs> you know they ripped and down they, they were so intimidated by that bowl initially uh, you know it it cold the herd so to speak it's a great bowl yeah the one that vans replicated is a lot easier to skate than the, the yeah. one, original one was gnarly it God. was gnarly <laughs> yeah crazy gnarly um let's talk about the hall of fame and stuff the uh grosso tribute anti-hero board that that came out along with it right yeah yeah i just did we were doing a, a board and you know with jeff it's funny the same Day that I found that morning, I found out I got you know nominated to be in the Hall of Fame. About an hour and a half later, I got a call that Jeff had passed. And it was just you went from total just like wow, that's pretty no cool. way I got Hall of Fame, and then like wow, yeah, it was nuts. That was, that was a tough oh, day. I had no, <laughs> no within damn. a couple of hours, literally. Oh and wow! The funny thing was, is I turned sixty just a couple of weeks before that, and Jeff was supposed to come. We had a, a 60th birthday party he was supposed to come and but uh, oliver had something up and he couldn't make it but uh mm. so i didn't get to see him before he passed that within that time but it, we took him on a bunch of skate trips through montana with amen and oh, yeah. and, now, and then idaho and now and he, he really enjoyed those it was great getting him out man i have no idea did we, so did the board come out how did the board come out um, we're just working on it. And I asked Christian uh, Cooper if he could do some, you know, graphics for me on that. Cause he did a lot of Jeff's graphics and I operate on humor. You know, I just kind of wanted to do a, I, I thought, geez, man in the hall of fame. And I, you know, I needed some new nine and three quarter decks and 10 inch decks and I, my shape. I'm like, geez, well, just, I have Watson make a few of these. And then, you know, Todd was nice enough to do that and Damon down there. And so, uh, um, Yeah. And, and and the graphics that Christian came up with, you know, and I said, I, I saw him once in the gold nugget. We're gambling of one late night and uh, he pulls up and taps me on the shoulder and says, hey, man, I'm like, what are you doing? He was playing some poker tournament. He was there with his wife. I was there with my wife. And so that's how the Grosso, you know, tribute little thing on the nose kind of came apart on the uh, – uh, came about because of, from the gold nugget it's pimping the gold nugget oh, yeah. how cool and they, they have the ace in there yeah this so i thought it'd be a, a, a good tribute nice. you know, you know found out at the same time it, 
And then the board, all this stuff was a, a picture that was taken in, uh, at, uh, I think it was a centerfold in, um, at Winchester in a content, one of the, in the first Winchester Hester contest, I mean, doing an air sunset. Uh-huh. Uh, Omar had a cowboy shirt on. That was a Del Mar employee, a skate ranch employee shirt. And I put, you know, I had patches sewn on it, gyro and tracker and that. And so he, he kind of incorporated those graphics into it. And then the bottom part, just the tribute to the SGV, but yeah, mm. pretty cool. He did a great job. <laughs> Chris? Fact, there's, there's a there's a, a, a Tex Gibson uh, Hall of Fame tribute board coming. Oh, cast good. But shortly here too. Sick. It's in the works. Yeah. Well, right before skating shut down, I mean, John was about to get a pro model from from Caster, and then it just died. You know, and Caster says, "We're not going to do this." And he went back to making surfboards, which is always his bread and butter. And so John went and skated for for TA. For, for Alda, which was mm. a good move on his part. Tony had called to ask him. I said, yeah. He said, man, it's, it's dying down here. So, yeah, he's, he's a great skater. Take good care of him. <laughs> mm. um, what do we think about the Hall of Fame? Um, I think it's fitting. I mean, um, initially it was kind of restrictive as far as the people they put in it. I mean, as they finally got it to where they started pulling the skaters and, and which helped and that brought a lot of more people in there. But I mean, I think some of the guys in the outlying areas who haven't been as recognized, you know, guys from Florida, or, you know, it's great. Texas getting in there. They put Johnson in there. Um, um, and the North hey, Blackheart's not in there yet. Yeah. Blackheart. He got in this time. Oh, he did get, Oh, yeah. that's right. Cause he went on the ramp. Of course I get in the year. That's the fucking lockdown. <laughs> it, it just went away. Myself, Pine, Saladino, myself, Blackheart, you know, Waldo. It's uh-huh. like, then just, it disappeared. And mm-hmm. so this year, I guess they're doubling it up with a class of 21. So it's going to be a pretty crowded event, I think. But, uh, I'm just, stoked. I mean, Todd and those guys and, 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 and and uh, condolences to Mark Waters. And I mean, he did a really good job of, of revamping the whole format, him and Lance and, you know, Laura and all that, that have put a lot of effort in, in, into doing this and keeping it alive and making it uh, a, a better process for the people to get in. I mean, it's just, they got to treat it like the Oscars though. They got to have the music come on. Cause you got guys up there that want to talk for three days and there's like 40 other days. It's like, so I, gnarly. You know I think Chick Kern's going to come back from the grave and do this one. And I, I think we're just going to run across the stage and give a peace song. <laughs> I don't think there's going to be much better. Believe me. I got uh, the, I got the, <laughs> <laughs> I should say, I got this story. The first time me and Phelps were at the combi contest, they were having the uh, Hall of Fame in the same hotel we were staying at, right across from the combi. We go in there and we're checking it out. Glenn Friedman goes up to uh, accept his award. He starts talking, and Jake's like, "Let's get the hell out of here." We go and we have dinner. We come back and he's still up there talking. And we're like, "Are you fucking kidding me?" You know, some long-winded folks. I mean, the classic one was Jay, was Adams. Yeah. Jay, we're in the parking lot having some, you know, accoutrements and a beer and that, and he's selling skateboards. <laughs> and he's talking about, you know, he got enough money to buy a flat-screen TV. And then he never went into the awards. T.A. had to go up there and talk for him, but he just <laughs> appeared. He went home. Let's go check the TV out. It was awesome. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's an interesting i mean you get the guys like blender and some of these guys that don't really want to get up and talk about themselves and then there's yeah. other guys that are dying to talk about themselves oh and i think some of the fo- fo- photographers have been underserved like ted like terabone and you know mofo and and uh mm. chasmus specifically chasmus should he should it's that's a big miss right there him not being there james should be definitely in the hall of fame because he he took a lot of photos and documented a lot of history of skating back in the day and was real, extremely good at it. Craig Feynman was another one mm. who's not with us anymore either. And he took a lot and nobody knows where his photos went. The Sharp brothers for that matter, both should be in there too. I mean, with their documentation and skateboard world and that, I mean, we wouldn't be here without those guys. I'm not claiming digital media now is different, but back then, I mean, guys, you know, 
you hear guys that I uh, talk about, they're, you know, from Montana and they long winters. I mean, they looked at that skateboarding magazine for, you know, four months while well, it was 10 degrees outside. So mm. uh, those guys need to be better served, especially in the hall of fame, I think too. And, and I think they'll, they'll write that wrong here shortly. Do you think there will be a day and time where Jake Phelps is nominated? Are you out of your mind? There's no reason he shouldn't be. Mm. And there's another one, you know, yeah. you know, just where he took Thrasher and all that. And, and even KT for that matter. Like I said, Mofo, that, those guys were, inst- you know, Fausto. I mean, it was all uh, instrumental in, in, in expanding the skating and keeping it alive. And just, it was, you know, it was, it was our Mac so to speak, all skaters mags, you know, mm. and, and then putting the music in it. I mean, you know, what, what skateboarder morphed into like action now is just action by, it was horrible. Oh, that was the worst thing I'd ever seen in my whole life. It had some stuff in it that was good, but they started putting the BMX stuff BMX, in BMX, yeah. Band. But I mean, Thrasher was always true to the core. They always had good gnarly bands in there, you know, and whatever. It's like, and now it's even more so. I mean, just like I said, it's it's great to see that it's thriving and, and still there. And, in, and still in print. This old guy's like print still. Thank you. That's the shit that we live for. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's crazy. Like, you don't want to jinx it, but literally you do go to the airport and Rolling Stone, Sports Illustrated, these magazines if they're there, they're very thin. Like Thrasher is not only the only skateboard mag, it's like the thickest, like besides style, like Vogue and those type of mags, there's no other mag in print. And I mean, I love it. Keep it. We got to keep it going, but it's just, it's insane. Oh, kind of. It's it's awesome. And I mean, it, and it, it, it heralds it. And you can go anywhere in the world. And now you got a Thrasher shirt on. People are like, wow, man, you got, hey, hmm. Yeah, one of the guys I work with, a CFO, I gave him a Thrasher shirt, and he was he, he had he flew in it. He was flying a plane. And he goes, and he, he's a real mellow guy. They they took him to secondary because he had a Thrasher shirt on. So <laughs> what you're a skater, dude. You're, you're, you're. <laughs> God damn it! <laughs> yeah, funny. thanks. I know you're marked, marked man. <laughs> Does uh, any of the covers of the history of the mag stick out to you as iconic for you, like? Besides you and the first one, um, like for me, the the Gibson one in the pipe with the shadow right around him, almost framed. So that one's that pretty classic. A great one. And now and when the guy's jumping off, is it the water tower on it? The uh, other one? Jeremy Ray. Yep. It's real. It exists. Yeah, that, that in Texas in, that in the pipe is just that's that's an insane photo. And I mean, it's freezing ass cold. He's got <laughs> pants on and a freaking, you know, flannel. And it's just a great photo. Yeah, everybody, you know, it's awesome to anybody that's been on the cover, you know, some of Olsen's and just uh, it's a good fraternity really is <laughs> but to be on it. I mean, in San Diego at one of the Action Now shows and when Thrasher was, I don't know, this is probably 30 or 25 year anniversary. I think Phelps was there. And they had all the covers and they had people signing them. Mm. And I pull in a booth. I don't think he recognized me. And I go, hey, man. And he goes, well, oh, yeah. And I said, oh, that's cool. Do you got a pen? He goes, well, what for? And I said, I'll sign, I'd like to sign my cover. And he's looking at me, what cover? <laughs> so I walked back because they were in chronological order. I walked back and I was like, oh, shit. You know, it's like, yeah, here, I'll sign this one for you. <laughs> so oh, pretty- so sick. Yeah. Damn. What's going on nowadays? Are you are you quite the gambler or? It sounds like you might have uh, put a hundred dollars on a certain baseball team to win the. Uh, uh, win yeah. it all. <laughs> I'm a Giants. I'm a dog, fan, you know. But I, last uh, Thanksgiving, we were uh, in Vegas for Thanksgiving when the COVID all hit, and that I was in a sports book. You, you love this story. And so I'm like, don't bet with your heart. Don't bet with your heart. I want to do some future bets, you know. Mm-hmm. That, Time to do it. World Series is over before spring training. Not only that, I made a I made a, a bet on the Canadians to make the uh, Stanley Cup, and that ticket was sixty to one. Fuck. And so I'm like the Giants. God, I can't. I'm gonna. I can't bet on the <laughs> Giants. There's no freaking way, man. Beat LA, beat LA, beat LA. I did. 
And uh, yeah, I got to take it right here. Uh, so yeah, Christian and I are going back and forth. I'm torn because I mean, the Dodgers and the Giants are the two best teams in baseball. They're freaking in the same crazy year. It's a, uh, it's, yeah, it's made it for a good, a, a great baseball year. So uh, as we record uh, this, we, there's four games left in the season. The Giants are two games up. There's four games left. Like that's where we're at. It's fun. And they play odds and they're, they're yeah. just, you know, fell apart. Yeah, the wheels fell off of them. It's crazy. Keep the wheels greased. Well, what do you got to say about the people that say that the Dodgers uh, World Series win was with an asterisk last year because there wasn't as many games and it was such a weird season? <laughs> yeah, dog. I think it, the asterisk is you know, appropriate. Yep. One, you know, 162 games, is a, that's a lot different than, you know, another 100 games on there. And you can see <laughs> there it takes on these guys and these teams and everything else. And I mean – the, the Giants, case in point, man, all their old guys, Posey and Crawford and that are stepping up. And, you know, I think the Dodgers pulled the trigger on the trade for Turner and, and Scherzer just so the Giants or the Padres wouldn't get them. And, yeah. uh, but, I mean, you look at both teams, it, it's the pitching that's really, you know, nobody expected the Giants pitching to be that good. Frisco icon. Yeah. Do you go to some games? Um, I haven't been to a Dodger game since McCord owned them because they, they ruined the experience. Last Dodger game I went to was at AT&T Park. Ah. <laughs> it was the last game of the, the season, the last full season they had. High drive to right, headed to the water. It is out of here. Oh. Oh. Great there too. So, yeah. yeah it's, we live a uh, block and a half from there. So yeah, it's, Giants. So sucked and so there was the whole stadium was almost all blue just to make rub it in a little bit <laughs> uh my guy I, you know if tony farmer at all nope no he's a socal guy but he he moved up here and he, great guy great pool skier he's good friends with salba and stuff um but he still got the dodger that's his whole deal he came to a giants game one night with me and it was wig night giants wigs he bought a blue wig and he's wearing it all like cocky and stuff. Some guy grabs the wig off his head, throws it in the cubby cove and spits on him. He's like, I deserve it. <laughs> yeah. Well, down here, they just shoot you or beat you up. I mean, and that's the thing. Like, it's a whole different, like there's fun and games. And then there's like, this ain't no country club. Well, there's the Giants and the Dodgers. But I mean, I've been a Ram fan forever and used to have season tickets and that. And then the Rams and the 49ers. And then you went through the whole Walsh, Montana era where the freaking Niners just dominated. And I mean, yeah. the Rams sucked. It was so horrible. <laughs> it's, it, it always flips and flops. But uh, yeah, it's been a great baseball season. I look forward to uh, watching the, how this, the playoffs go and everything else. I can't wait. We're really I, excited. The Dodgers, I do not want to play the freaking Cardinals because the Cardinals, I'll have their number or anybody. Especially a one game. It's like It's like anything can happen in one game. You know, oh, yeah. if it's the best of three, like, okay, maybe like this, you know, the better team probably will win. But like in one game, the worst team could win still. Like it's, anything can happen. Yeah. And what and how the pitching sets up and everything else. You know, I mean, everybody was saying how great, you know, Scherzer was and all that. And his last two games have been crap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, he might be running out of the gas a little bit. It oh, could be. I think the adrenaline's probably over in that. So are you still skating a lot, Spain? Yeah, I mean, I do mostly video work, so I I skate behind people a lot. But like, I'll I'll get out and skate. Um, I kind of just try to skate with my friends though, so it's like it's that's not all. not as much as I used to. That, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean the, the the SGV guys, Nash, and all those guys, they they call and help me to go all the time, so I have to go. Yeah, so it's good. They get me out, and I skate a lot. It makes me skate a lot more than I would. Let's put it that way. Have you learned anything along the way as far as keeping the longevity going? Like, uh, do you do stretching or eat any supplements? Thank God for Hessel Gray back and when we were young, taught me and Wally and all that how to uh, – uh, lose my – taught me and Wally how to uh, stretch. And he, he taught yoga classes and used to take us to them. And so that's really key. And just staying active other ways too. But, I mean uh – -huh. Skating is a great workout in itself. It's a lot better than playing golf. 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh my yeah, God. It's one of those things, though. Uh, a local guy here, he's he's older. He's probably a year or two younger than me. But uh, his philosophy is every day he gets out and he rolls. No matter what, he's just rolling because that keeps his body hit. You know, if you stop for a few days, then the next time you skate, it's harder on your body as you're getting older and stuff. So that's really inspirational, but it's like, dude, we don't all have, to, like, we all have lives too I, nowadays. I'm working brother. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. No, but no, just having good bros and skating itself. It's just, I mean, it's, it's like a drug itself. I mean, it come mm. around with all your bros and even, even if you're not feeling good, we always need a beer caddy, you know? So <laughs> it's worth fine, you know, but yeah. Uh -huh. I, I, when I didn't skate for a while and, and I had a good friend of mine take me and over to the Pasadena Royal because uh, you can't drop this. And uh, I dropped it and I was like, somebody just gave me the drug again. I was, the golf clubs got rusty. The bikes went <laughs> like, why, why hadn't I been doing this? You know? So it's just okay. intensely. And uh, I've been doing it ever since for the last eight, 17, 18 years. But it was good to take a break. I mean, when I was done, I was probably, I got married, I was about 30 something, about 80, um, or about 90. My body was cooked. It took a, mm. probably a good five to seven years to heal. <laughs> I mean, I get pretty bad arthritis in the shoulder and necks because I'm a computer, like I'm doing video editing all the time. So it's just that, you know, that tension right there. Um, but other than that, like my, luckily my knees and ankles are pretty good. Then you're good. Yeah. Keep them right, man. And you'll be good, Schmitty. That's yeah. <laughs> Did you pay any attention to the Olympics? Yeah. Oh, yeah. What did you think? Um, I think that the pandemic kind of screwed it up because they didn't get enough time to really skate the bull. But, I mean, Keegan, I've seen him skate when he was more of a grom at Oceanside pre-pandemic. And, I mean, incredible. Pedro... And, and Wally, Wally had called out that the Japanese team, uh, especially the female team, was going to be women's team was going to be incredible. Oh yeah, I mean they they trained with their gymnastics team and that. And I mean they finished forty five second runs. They could have gone another minute and a half. And you saw these other gal women in there that were gassed. And I mean I think um, it was just good to show the world that this is a sport. And and we like I said. I think I did an interview in to skateboarder or whatever. And I said, you know, if skateboarding ever makes it an Olympic, it'll just prove us out as the athletes that we are. Even I use that bad word, but um, mm. I always said that because I played other sports and, and to skate and to do what we did skating at that level was incredible. And I mean, you have to be, have some athletic ability to get there, period. And uh, it was absolutely. It was, I mean, the street stuff was good. I mean, they ran it. The super slow-mo camera helped because you could actually see the nuances it. Mm -hmm. But the flow and the bowl was just, it was good. I mean, I was i was pretty stoked. My biggest complaint with the thing was the bowl skating, the camera work was really amateur. There was a lot of crane camera that looked like a dude was on it for the first time and was experimenting or something. I was I, like, what are again, they filming? They had enough time, Schmitty, to, you know, work yeah. out the kinks and that. So here it is. I mean, those guys got limited or no time to skate that place from what I understand either. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I'm still fucking, I'm so over the pandemic being the blanket excuse for everything, but it makes sense that, yeah, they didn't have enough time for that shit. Yeah, uh, no, it's crazy. I gotta, I'm going to lose you if I don't plug you in. <laughs> yeah no i at least they still had it and they still got to go i mean bryce got to go over there and shoot and then and then they didn't he shot street stuff they didn't let him shoot what he's the best at <laughs> oh wow i haven't talked yeah. to him since he's been back from there huh well dude i really appreciate you taking the time it was great fucking chatting with you we always end uh the program with like uh if you were going to go into a bar and fucking hit the jukebox that has every song ever made and you fucking throw in the one that just hypes it up for the ride out. Uh, geez, that's a long catalog. I got a long catalog, a lot of good stuff and that, but I mean, if it was something current, mm. probably army reserve by uh, Pearl jam. 
Cool. Yeah, I did an interview with Jeff and it was really fucking rad. I, I'd never got to meet him before. And uh, we have so many mutual friends. And then it was just it was really early in the pandemic and it was super cool. I, a great human being. He's I done know. a lot for skating, too. Man. Yeah, I got to get out there and ski his bowl. It, um, it seems I love Montana. We've been to a bunch of the parks and. I didn't know him at the time, so we didn't get to skate his backyard. But uh, there's a bunch of new shit there since oh, I've been yeah. there too. Billy, Billy at Evergreen is doing a hell of a job building. Montana is definitely a destination if you're skating, and, and Billy's a great human being, and all huh. the stuff building up there. And they're doing a bunch of parks right now in and around Boulder, also. But Colorado. Evergreen, yeah, but I mean okay. Evergreen and, and Dream Run and the and, uh, Grind Line and that. Thanks to all those guys, man. Definitely. Period. Yeah. And yeah. It's in pain and all of them. I mean, it couldn't be better. Where's what's the city? Like what park up in Montana? If like, which, which ones speak out to you? Um, Great Falls is an interesting place. It's big and enormous and kind of in an area that was pretty gnarly. I mean, Alan has the pipe, right? I think Chris yeah. had a cover there. Yeah. Um, and then uh, obviously the treasure bowl at Jeff's is, is awesome. Um, uh, Browning that has the, uh, the remake of the big O capsule. I mean, uh-huh. they did an incredible job bringing that to current standards. Uh-huh. Um, Havers, Havers bowl is fun. Okay. And, yeah. They're just, they're did so you much make work. it to Dylan at all? Yeah. Dylan. I yes, love that correct. one. Dylan's fun, man. Dylan's like a figure eight and it's just, whew, yeah. Up and over the pipe. Uh-huh. Yeah. I love that yeah. one. Did you go to the taco wagon or the taco bus? I really like tacos. No. Best, best tacos, best Mexican food in Montana right there. Really? And it's a guy serving it out of a bus. Yeah. It's insane. It's when crazy. we, when we were there, there was like a rodeo in town. So it was it was full Montana experience and grind line was finishing the park. The park wasn't even completely done wow. yet. So it was really cool. We camped out with Hubbard and those guys and like helped them bring blocks over to the coping area. But then we went down and the streets were all roped off and it was cowboy city. It was great. God damn Dylan. <laughs> well, and there's Patagonia street and it's amazing. There's that Patagonia store there, right? Mm-hmm. Well, Chenard had it. his mistress lived in Dylan. Oh, and that's why okay. The store was there. <laughs> that's great. A little trivia, man. <laughs> yeah, Evil Knievel was in Montana. It was yeah, it was good yes, state. Good river state. and all that. But no, yeah, that's me. I appreciate you uh, having me. Thanks, man. No, appreciate you, man. Thank you so much. And uh, reach down. out ever if I can help you in any way. Yeah, and if you're down this way, man, look me up. We'll yeah, let's link up. Chris and have a beer. <laughs> I'd love that for sure. Okay, cool. Thank you. Right, Thank Take you for care, listening man. to another episode of Talking Schmidt. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Anchor, Spotify, or anywhere you get your podcasts. When you subscribe, you'll get notifications every Tuesday of new episodes the minute they become available. Also, please leave reviews and a five-star rating. It's the best way to help the show grow. All of the episodes will always remain free, but if you would like to help support the show, you can do so at TalkingSchmidt.com, where you can pick up some merchandise like t-shirts, beanies, hats, and stickers. The website has an entire archive of all of the episodes, with extra photos and videos. Email us with any suggestions, comments, or ways that the show may have improved your life at TalkingSchmidt at gmail.com. All interviews are conducted, edited, and produced by Schmidty. The intro music is Mary's Cross by the band Nature. Very special shout out goes to the executive director, Cheryl Camisa. Shout out. Love it! This is Talking Schmidt, where the Rolodex is deep, but the conversation is deeper.